Welcome to the France Van Cat debate. European elections have never, it seems, been so significant. And the fallout keeps on coming. In France, leader of the centre-right party, that's Les Républicains, Laurent Vauquier has resigned, citing the poor results uh, for his party in the European elections eight days ago. And it doesn't end there. Angela Merkel's prime minister's walked too. She's uh, Andrea Nal Nalis? Nalis? Nalis. Nalis, thank you. Germans in the house, they can help me with this one. Andrea Nalis of the SDP, uh, another party caned by the voters. The political landscape of Europe then changing, or so we're led to think, but where will all this lead us? Here to discuss, we have a panel of, uh, well, interested and interesting observers, starting with Marion van Rentegem, who's journalist, author of Angela Merkel, The Political UFO, and this book, Mon Europe, Je t'aime moi non plus. Thank you very much indeed, and I'm keeping Thank the book. You. Okay, there you go. <laughs> On the other side of the studio, they're not necessarily against, it's not that kind of show. Birgit Holzer, who is uh, a German journalist uh, based here in Paris, uh, working for 12 local German papers, including the Berliner Zeitung. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Number three of our panel of five. Alex Taylor, European journalist, great to see you, sir. Uh, author of the book, Brexit, l'autopsie d'une illusion, in English that would be? Well, I think we could translate it pretty safely as Brexit, the autopsy of an illusion. It's <laughs> <laughs> a word for word translation. Well, I, I like it and we're looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, sir. So thank you three for being with us. We've got two guests joining us from afar. And just because you're in Berlin doesn't mean to say we don't want to hear your voice. We want to hear your voices loudly and clearly. First off, Jakob von Weizsäcker, who is Chief Economist of the German Federal Ministry of Finance. Jakob, thank you very much for being with us. And in a different studio, in a different part of the German capital, Klaus Peter Wilsch, who is Member of the German Parliament for the CDU Party. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, we have a situation then where Europe perhaps changing. I'm beginning with our guests here in the studio. Uh, Marion, I'll start with you. Um, because I've got to start somewhere. <laughs> what do you think these elections mean in terms of what is happening to Europe now? Well, I think that these elections will be remembered as a um, historical and very special event because it happened, it's the first time that uh, some elections happen when uh, the United States, our natural ally, has turned uh, their back to us and uh, is uh, fighting European Union. It's the first time that you have uh, new powers, uh, new big powers like China, India, and uh, uh, coming up to, to the political and worldwide scene. And uh, European is getting weaker and weaker. And it's the first time that you have uh, national parties, uh, though divided, um, who come, who have a new dynamics and go into the parliament as a new strength. So for all these reasons, I think it's a very important thing that happened. And the turnout, was, which was uh, bigger than, than usual, expresses that uh, I think the people realize that something very, um, very special and crucial was at stake at this moment. Uh, the, um, the split between right and left has, re has been replaced by another split, which is uh, pro-Europeans against uh, anti-Europeans. And uh, Emmanuel Macron in, in, uh, was partly right when he tried to oppose uh, these two new parties. OK, thank you for now, Brigitte. Let me, let me bring you in on, on a similar theme. In terms of what you saw, were you surprised by the performance of any one particular group within Europe? Um, I think I'm surprised when I'm looking at Germany and mm at France because the Green parties um, became quite strong. It was uh, especially a surprise in France because polls didn't really see this coming up. They didn't really see young people voting much more than normally they vote. Um, in both countries, young people um, were voting a lot for Green parties or ecologist parties. In Germany, it was not such a, such a big surprise, but in Germany, the Green party is now the second one. Um, the SPD, uh, as you said, um, uh, really uh, got down. Uh, so this is um, looking at those both countries, the, mo the most uh, interesting um, conclusions for me. Also seeing that the big traditional parties, they are not longer big. I think um, uh, the voters are not anymore uh, so loyal for um, their, their parties. And I think it's also interesting when you look at the na nationalist parties, because they don't really want, get, want to get out of Europe now. Um, when, you see, when you hear what um, uh, Marine Le Pen is mm -hmm. saying, it's the mm -hmm. same for the IFT in Germany. Um, they want to stay in Europe now because most of the people w don't really want their countries to leave. Um, so they want to work 
in the European um, Parliament, they want to have a big group and uh, they want to be able to do pressure. Um, so for me, for me, this is a big change too, that they no, no longer um, are uh, fighting for Frexit. Um, so uh, they don't really explain how they want to work together in this uh, uh, European Parliament and what is really their what are the, really their common points, but um, they are playing on, um, on this new, uh, on this, uh, new um, situation. People really don't really want to want their countries to leave, and maybe also because they're seeing what's happening uh, about Brexit. Indeed, Brexit, which takes us very nicely to Alex Taylor, who's written the book. Um, in terms of, is, is, is it the Brexit factor that has led to the Europeans being, well, I'll get off the fence, interesting this time? I think that um, I think that the traditional right and left, uh, if you look at what's happened in Britain, which in some ways is a, a kind of full player of um, you know, general trends. I mean, it's it's, it's populism uh, in 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 the act. It's actually happened in the sense that uh, people have made the decision to leave the European Union, and I think that that has. Um, kind of like pulverise the traditional right and left. If you look at the right and left, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party and the Brexit elections, they came uh, really low. The Conservative Party was in fifth place. So we're talking about a historical party, which thinks of itself as the governing party mm. in Britain, came fifth place. I mean, that's, that's never happened before. And if you look at what's happening inside each of these parties, they just cannot come to grips with this basic identity question, which has replaced, as you were saying, the traditional left and right in most people's ideas. Maybe because I think over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, especially with the financial crisis, traditional parties of the centre-left and centre-right didn't really seem to be producing very much different solutions to this, and everybody seemed to be having the same problems. And so all of a sudden, along comes this identity crisis. I think the interesting question is to know to what extent it really corresponds to what people um, are concerned about. Because, for example, if you look in 2012 at opinion surveys in Britain, people were asked, do you care about whether Britain is uh, a member of the European Union or not, about 2% of people said that it was, that it was a, a, an important topic for them. So this has been, in some ways, manufactured uh, to become an important thing. But whatever, it's now the important question. Left and right, the Labour Party, uh, the Conservative Party in Britain have no idea what, what the solution to Brexit is. Half of them want Brexit, half of them don't want mm. Brexit on both sides. So to replace this, people feel... Uh, much stronger in terms of whether they have national identity or whether they have a, a, an international, European or whatever it is, identity. And if you look at the British elections, the European uh, elections, what's very interesting, and in the kind of like um, uh, the postcard version we have of what happens in different uh, countries, nobody points this out. But there are actually, if you take all, if you take the, the parties which are specifically for Brexit, and if you take the, the parties which were specifically anti Brexit, the anti Brexit parties had about 40%, and the pro Brexit parties had 35%. So, uh, and then the other two parties but just do don't know what they think. As a, as well, no, that's the whole point because they Labour doesn't know. know. Labour <laughs> doesn't know, and Conservatives Sadly. doesn't know. So, if you take them out of the equation, mm -hmm. yeah. then the whole situation re resolves around this question, which has suddenly become the question, rather than mm -hmm. if people are right or left, which doesn't seem to have any sense anymore. Do you believe in nationality as being the the, the part of your identity, or do you believe in a more open? Uh, identity, maybe people, somebody like me, for example, I think very much of myself as being British. I'm French, but I'm above all European. I'd like, to put, I'd like to put that to you during a football match, perhaps. Let me just pause you there and bring in our guests uh, from Berlin. <laughs> I'm not quite sure you'd support. I don't uh, like football. Oh, well, that's fair enough. <laughs> Problem is solved. Rugby, let's go Eurovision somewhere Song Contest might be more difficult. <laughs> good man, good man. Let's bring in uh, from the... Uh, German uh, Federal Ministry of Finance, Jakob von uh, Weizsäcker. Jakob, thank you for joining us. Uh, feel free to join in, and if I hear you, I'll bring you into the debate any time you wish, sir. Same for you, Klaus-Peter Wilsch, who I'm coming to next. Uh, so, Jakob, in terms of okay. what we've seen, what's happening in Europe, where do you feel that it's going, sir? Well, I, th I think, uh, as always, when there are big changes ahead, there's an er inherent tension between those who say, well, we are, um, in that case, a well-educated, mobile, young, ecological avant-garde, and we just want to go ahead and do things. Um, and, 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 of course, uh, with a slight tendency 
to try and demonstrate to the other half of the population that they're backward, old-fashioned, and, and somehow in the way. Um, and there are those who say, well, let's actually create something a little bit more inclusive as a platform. Let's convince everybody that there's enormous value added to all citizens in Europe um, of the European Union. Um, and, and this is a normal tension when things are changing. And uh, one of the uh, previous speakers pointed to the fact we live in a different world. We live in a world where we can no longer um, entirely rely on uh, the security guarantee um, uh, of the US as we're used to. I, I hope that's going to change again. We live in a world where, where to our east, we have Putin. We, we, we live in a world where we have China, uh, which is rising. We live in a world uh, that's soon going to consist of 8 billion uh, people. And so uh, no member state, even the biggest, even Britain, France, or Germany, on, on by themselves can hope to deal with the challenges ahead. So sticking together, uh, creating real European value added, both when it comes to external challenges, when it comes to uh, climate change, when it comes to technological disruption and digitalization, uh, when it comes to the question, well, how, how can you maintain a welfare state um, in a global environment where it's increasingly difficult to tax uh, companies uh, and uh, make them pay taxes uh, um, uh, where, where they should. Um, these are challenges we're, we're in for together. Uh, and so I think one of the critical questions is, are we going to demonstrate, even to those who doubt the European project, that yes, indeed, um, uh, this is going to create a lot of value. Thank you, sir. Stay, stay with us, please. Stay with us. We appreciate your, your, your perspective and your points of view. Let's bring in Klaus-Peter Vilsch from the CDU party, a uh, member of the German parliament. Um, Klaus-Peter Vilsch, I, I don't want to sort of just pin you down on what this means for uh, the coalition in Germany. This is a far broader debate, but I've got to start there, obviously, because of the, the resignation that's happened and where that leaves the coalition. Um, some might say that um, Angela Merkel's between a rock and a hard place. What would you say, sir? Well, just let's wait and see what happens to the coalition. Uh, this is uh, our partner, our coalition partner, who is uh, well a bit in, uh, in shadows now. But um, looking at the outcome of the uh, European elections, it's uh, uh, really true that we have performed bad. Uh, and that um, our bad performance is only covered by the even worse performance of the Social Democrats. We lost a lot of votes, a lot of voters, and um, it, proportion at least. And um, the reason for that is um, that, of course, there is some fatigue about all those crisis management and all those, uh, those summits, um, especially uh, concerning uh, our common um, uh, currency. You know, um, the German gave in a lot uh, when we uh, gave our Deutsche Mark uh, into uh, the euro. And uh, we promised people then that every country has to take care for its own debt and for its own um, budget. And um, what people saw the last 10 years with all those, well, rescuing um, actions uh, for Greece, for other countries, uh, they got the feeling that they uh, are uh, now um, what they are now supposed to pay for the debt of other countries, and this is against uh, that what was committed uh, to, and where all the countries that are within uh, the European uh, Currency uh, Union uh, also have committed themselves uh, along their special voting um, agenda to. Um, take care for that. Now we see that Mr. Salvini is uh, asking for relief there, although uh, we still have uh, really big problems uh, with uh, non-performing loans in the Italian banking sector, uh, that we have a, uh, um, a deficit which is far beyond um, the one that is allowed along the treaty, and we have to come back. Uh, to, uh, um, to the uh, rule of law in all those terms. The second is that um, a lot of our people have the feeling that uh, subsidiarity uh, is not uh, enough uh, taken care for, that um, the EU should, of course, handle for, uh, let's say, trade policy, um, 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 uh, policy uh, for the agro sector, uh, also, but also uh, taking care for um, the uh, frontiers to uh, really secure the exterior frontiers in order to keep the Schengen, uh, the Schengen room open. 
So there uh, is, of course, um, a, uh, well, kind of uh, fatigue, as I said. I've been telling in the campaign all uh, the voters, well, uh, this European Parliament uh, will matter to us and uh, just go to vote. And they did it in a growing number this time. And uh, we came through uh, on the force first place. We are not uh, content with that at any, but um, uh, it's still uh, another thing than uh, looking at France, where uh, Monsieur Macron was passed over by Madame Le Pen, uh, which is really a pity. Would you say, uh, just staying with you for a moment, Klaus Peter Vilsch, that what you are paying for now is perhaps the mishandling of the migrant crisis? Uh, once again, please, I didn't get this. Would you say that perhaps what you've paid for now is the mishandling of the migrant crisis? Well, um, of course, um, there is a well, kind of institutional uh, crisis. Uh, try to explain people why uh, there is a need for one um, president of the commission and another 27 commissioners. Um, of course, people ask us, why is this um, administration growing all the time and trying to collect uh, duties uh, that could easily be done by the regions or by the member states? And this is where people um, hope uh, and ask for answers uh, by us, and I think we have to deliver there. Otherwise, we will keep those who want to destroy um, our framework in Europe um, the way we have to um, really look at uh, institutional reforms, at uh, um, making um, the process uh, of, uh, the, um, uh, of uh, the European Union more transparent and, um, well, kind of rejecting, kind of uh, only um, concentrate on those things that, had re uh, that really have to be uh, regulated on the European uh, level um, and cannot uh, be um, taken care for uh, on national or regional level. OK, we'll leave it there for now. Neatly sidestepped on that question there. We'll come back to what, that one about the migrant crisis a little bit later, perhaps. Uh, part one uh, is done. Stay with us. Part two, come back very shortly. Welcome back to part two of the uh, France 24 debate. It's the European elections we're debating, and it seems that they've never been so significant as they are right now. The fallout continues. There have been two high-profile uh, resignations at domestic level, one in France, one in Germany, both as a result of the situation in the elections, their parties performing poorly. Even in Italy, we've had the Prime Minister making the statement because his party uh, didn't uh, cut the mustard, as they say. I don't know you'd say that in Italian, but you're getting the picture. What's happening on a European scale is increasingly important domestically. We're asking the question, is the shift of power changing, not just in Europe and in Brussels, but also going down to domestic level too? Is what's happening on a European scale having a real impact on domestic politics? Let's bring in our panel, who uh, so far have come with some very scintillating uh, insight. Uh, in no order of preference, first, Marianne van uh, Rendenheim, who is uh, a journalist, uh, author of the book Mon Europe, Je t'aime moi non plus. Thank you very much for being with us. On the other side of our studio, Birgit Holzer, who is also a German journalist. Great to see you. Uh, who works for 12 local papers, including the Berliner Zeitung. Thank you for being with us here. Alex Taylor is a European journalist, author of uh, the book uh, Brexit, L'autopsie d'une illusion which is the autopsy of the illusion of Brexit, I think. Is that, does you that could pass? translate it like, yes, yeah, yeah. it captures the mood. I, w I, wouldn't, get, I wouldn't get any, any work <laughs> translated like that, I imagine. Thank you, sir, for, for tolerating me. Uh, two guests joining us from Berlin, and they have, uh, believe me, insight and analysis to boot. Jakob von Weizsäcker is a chief economist of the German Federal Ministry of Finance. Uh, Jakob, thanks for being with us. And Klaus Peter Wilsch, who we heard from at the end uh, of the first part there from the CDU party, uh, member of the German parliament, who was telling us uh, all about the uh, effect uh, of the election on the uh, German coalition and, of course, the resignation that has uh, just happened. And he says, we've got to wait and see how it all pans out. Thank you for being with us. Uh, both men in Berlin, don't hesitate to join in, and I will try to bring you into the debate uh, as soon as you have uh, something uh, to add. I'm starting again here in the studio uh, with my three guests here. Uh, Birgit, you were saying that you, in, in, in part one there, listening to our German MP disagreed with some of the things he was saying about Europe. Can you clarify what you meant? Yes, because it was, he was, he's been talking about a fatigue, and I think it's not really a fatigue of Europe. I think um, most of 
the big majority of, of people in Germany um, are not really um, tired of Europe. Uh, maybe they are tired of the way um, it's it's presented as um, just managing crisis. But I think um, European elections are also in a way the reflecting national the national situation and i think people are tired in a way of the big coalition so the 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 alliance of the social democrats and the uh, conservative party of angela merkel um, i think they just don't know where they want to go. Uh, they just don't really explain what is uh, important for them. Um, they don't really, um, pe people in Germany, and I think it's the same in France for um, pe the pe people who voted before for the big parties, they just can't, don't have a real profile. Um, and so uh, the people are, are search the, the electors are searching um, different ways, different voices they want to hear. Um, so I think for me it's not, uh, it's not against uh, the way Eu Europe is, um, Europe is um, <coughs> managed. In, uh, or it, maybe it is against the way Europe is managed, but, but because the big parties or the part parties who are managing, managing Europe are not explaining how, where they want to go. And we don't know who will be the president of the commission. We don't really even know how he will be chosen. Um, so um, I think it's, it's um, n now it's um, uh, the task of the parties to show where they want to go and if they want to continue this coalition, how they want to do it. But what you're talking about in terms of how Europe's perceived, it, it kind of says there's a little bit of like shadiness there where people don't quite know the public, the voters, don't quite know what's going on and why. And it leads to the doubts that bring in the whole Brexit thing, Alex, with sort of the people in the UK will stand there in front of a massive complex, which is funded by European cash, and say, yeah, but we're sick of Brussels because they do nothing for us. Because there's no sense of what it brings, but there's a sense of somehow something's being hidden or some, there's some obfuscation going on. The, the great problem of Europe over the last uh, decades has been that nobody really defends it. Uh, mm. I think that it's actually quite a good idea. I think that uh, what's happened in the European Parliament for these elections will um, revigorate the European debate because, paradoxically, I mean really paradoxically, the fact that nationalist populists have now arrived en masse and that they've, uh, everybody's talking about them uh, will mean that I think Finally, at last, the other side, the pro-Europeans, will have to um, motivate themselves uh, because when you see who, uh, when you see the kind of like the people who do who defend um, the the nativists, I call it the populist point of view. For example, they're always very dynamic. I mean, Nigel Farage is the most dynamic. Um, he's always down the pub, photographed drinking a pint. He's got a kind of uh, a good image. Um, he's managed to somehow man convince every man that he represents them. But in yeah, fact, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, they're on very paper, good doesn't talk, does he, you know? on television. The mm. problem is, it's much easier to be very good on television when you're defending a populist nationalist mm. uh, point of view. If if you're defending the whole of Europe, it's actually quite difficult. There are a few people who stand out, like uh, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, for example, is, is uh, multinational and very dynamic. Guy Verhofstadt, everybody knows Guy Verhofstadt. But, but there are not that many um, Europeans. And uh, I think that uh, one of the, the, the paradoxical advantages of at last having these populists all arriving together and trying to work together. We'll see how successful that's going to be pretty quickly. I think that they, they're all going to fall out with each other. But because they, uh, they're, they're going to, they're, they're going to um, make the debate more um, interesting on their side, I think that finally, I mean, I've been doing programs about Europe on French television for the last 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that um, the phrase I've heard Every, every month or so, somebody said, oh, l'Europe n'intéresse personne, Alex. Mm -hmm. Europe doesn't interest anybody. And it's true. I mean, when you think of the Brexit, I mean, who was, uh, there was Farage. But who was opposite Farage? Mm. David Cameron, who spent the whole of his career saying how awful the European Union is, and then went into the campaign to, to, to defend Britain staying in the European Union with a kind of idea of, well, it's not that great, but do we really want to take the risk of leaving it? The problem is, and the what, I mean, I won't name a kind of not too distant country from here, but when you see who they put up against the populists, I mean, the, the, 
of the French. I mean, she's a, a, fan, a very nice woman, but she may be the, the person who, who spearheaded the, the, the anti-Le Pen campaign here was not by any means uh, dynamic enough. So I think that with all these nationalists, like you've got in, in the Netherlands too, you've got this guy who puts naked photos of himself on his Twitter account, uh, Monsieur Baudet, I can't remember his first name. Um, you've got a lot of very kind of people who generate Twitter feeds and, and so forth on the populist side, there's not that many dynamic, interesting people. And I think that they're going to have to wake up now if they want to fight against the other side. Indeed. And it's not just a question of posting naked pictures. Right. It's a question of having ideas, isn't it? And sort of actually coming well, forward. Well, not always, unfortunately, ideas. because the ideas... I mean, if, when you talk about Brexit, why did people vote for Brexit? Because of the, the idea that they were going to get £350 million uh, extra a week. And that fell uh, down. Exposes so the ideas, lie completely. I mean, you know, lies lie. Boris, Boris Johnson perhaps going to court to answer that one. Let's bring in uh, from Berlin uh, Jakob von uh, Weizsäcker, uh, Chief Economist at the German Federal Ministry of Finance. I'm not just asking you economic questions, sir. Of course, you've got opinions on everything, so you're allowed to join in at any time you wish, sir. Don't just wait for a financial question. But in terms of what we're saying here about future, uh, the future of Germany and um, what it means and the future of Europe as well, um, do you feel that Germany can continue to be the kind of motor power within uh, the European Union? Will that continue? Does the French role need to grow? Is someone else going to come forward and take over the, the mantle, do you think? Well, I, I, I don't think this is about uh, who is leading Europe. I think this is about uh, European countries coming together um, and doing what is uh, good for them collectively. I think one of the difficulties in the past 10 years have been that country have got, countries have gotten awfully good at, uh, for example, there, there are lots of Germans who are now experts in the Italian banking sector and they know all the flaws about it. It's a little bit what it says in the Bible. Um, why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye instead of noticing the beam of wood in your own eye? And I think in, in the same way, you know, the French are accusing the Germans of having a, a large ex, a, a current account surplus. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, the Dutch are accusing everybody else for not being uh, sufficiently thrifty. And, and, uh, and this has gone on for quite a while. And, and, and I think it's caused a lot of damage. I think what we need to do is we need to come together. Uh, we need to strengthen our European institutions. Where the European institutions really um, have been transferred, actual decision-making power, executive powers, for example, in the area of trade, for, the, uh, for example, in the area of competition, and yes, indeed, with the European Central Bank in the area um, of monetary policy, Europe is working surprisingly well. But the trouble is that then often these parts of Europe that work quite well have to pick up the pieces um, of where Europe isn't working so well. So it's, it's about strengthening the institutions in the areas where things are not working well. That includes, by the way, uh, it's a question you asked earlier, that includes the question of how are we going to organize ourselves to assure the humanitarian treatment of refugees, but at the same time to assure the control of external borders. That uh, includes the question, how are we going to help countries who find themselves in financial trouble, but at the same time make certain that they behave responsibly fiscally in normal times? These sort of things we really need to sort out. Um, and I think if we do, uh, 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 th then we're going to have a great five years with the next European Commission. But if we don't, we're really asking for trouble. That is well, a warning uh, indeed, I... sir. A warning. Yes, can bring in, uh, I think I can hear Klaus uh, Peter Vilsch who wants to comment. Yes. Over to you, sir. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I think, uh, of course, we need to have uh, control over, uh, over our, our external uh, borders, um, and we cannot uh, solve uh, the poverty uh, problems uh, in the world, or in Africa, or in the, uh, on the Arabic Peninsula, uh, by getting them all in. So, uh, of course, this was a, a problem that uh, was really crucial for a lot of people. And the second thing is, uh, talking about the European um, uh, central bank. Uh, of course, uh, the central bank did um, uh, worked or, or acted um, far beyond its mandate. It's printing money like hell, and uh, we all um, know that uh, within the 
uh, contracts within their uh, legal framework. Uh, we consented uh, with all partners within the European Monetary Union and the so-called no bailout principle. And um, people are really uh, eager to see uh, that uh, the rule of law is back also in this um, uh, uh, part of politics. And uh, of course, um, it is not easy to explain Europe because it's objectively very complicated. Um, now, um, our uh, big parties in Germany, um, uh, with their families, or let's say for the part, at least for the former big parties, um, turned out to have um, so-called, well, running um, uh, top candidates. Um, and they told people they will be um, the one who has uh, his nose uh, in front will be the next um, um, uh, commission's president. Um, we hear from the other side, which is from the legal framework, are true that, of course, uh, the, the Council of um, Heads uh, of States and Governments uh, has really uh, the decision on the first hand. So we really have to uh, discuss about this. Uh, with Manfred Weber, um, he turned out um, very well in this country of Bavaria. Um, they made more than 40 percent there that year, so our sister party in Bavaria. Um, and he has, uh, therefore, a strong mandate. And um, well, I hope that uh, the others uh, will be ready to accept him, because uh, he, this would be a very strong sign also for the German public. Um, looking at the the European Central Bank. Uh, I also think that after a, um, a, a guy from Netherlands, uh, Wim Doisenbach, and a French um, central banking a banker, and uh, now an Italian one, uh, we would be um, ready uh, to um, offer a German one. Uh, we have a really tough guy there um, with Weidmann heading uh, the central bank, the German central bank. So um, we have, of course, uh, to talk about all these points, the governments especially, and then the parliament also, uh, in order to get things fixed. You have to um, take care for bigger and smaller countries. You have to take care for the south and the north. You have to take care for those who depend uh, or rely on uh, deficit spending, uh, along with the others, who go more for stability in, 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 in a budgetary process. Uh, so it's really a heavy task, and I hope that that our leaders will be able to do a good job there. Um, I really think that uh, Europe is uh, worth uh, every effort uh, we are uh, uh, supposed to take there. And um, we should also be open for, uh, well, kind of reshaping, uh, probably without um, changing um, the uh, legal framework, because that seems very difficult to me um, if we even don't get um, perhaps a majority in France or somewhere where, you, where we have to go to the, to the people for, for a voting there. So, so um, it is not over. It's uh, been uh, also um, good signs. Uh, we in Germany had our special problems uh, with a big coalition, uh, especially also my party, left the agenda setting um, process to the Green, and that's why they performed that well. We should work on our own agenda. We have the people, we have to tell the people a lot about what we reach and uh, what we are uh, still intent to reach. So, um, so this could, I need to, uh, I need to stop you and bring in the guests in the studio. Yeah. So Thank you very much indeed. There's a lot, lots to pick over in what Klaus Peter Busch was saying there in terms of what Europe is and what it's about. But one thing that came through to me was that it's too complicated. Would you agree, Marion, that it's complicated or is it made to be complicated? Is it the way it's handled that's the problem? I think that uh, if we ended up to what we are now, I mean, with this uh, sense of a uh, of a fatigue towards the European Union. It's the fault of the leaders. It's the fault of the national leaders and European leaders, but mostly of the national leaders in Europe, who systematically for decades and decades and decades have pushed their responsibilities off to, for, uh, by blaming the European Union and, um, and trying to, 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 to make their own fault forgettable and by, by blaming the Union. And I think that uh, the leaders 
have a lack of uh, of love for Europe. They are they are no they are losing themselves by details and technical details, and. Uh, they they have never there, there's a, a, a flagrant lack of pedagogy on on European on European Union on the necessity of European Union on and uh, it's uh, the turnout that we've seen in the last elections uh, is a signal that when the European Union is under threat because it is now you you have the nationalist strengths going on you have the all the the globalization showing um, uh, new new powers new big powers and and the the power of the European Union is declining more and more, and suddenly the citizens are realizing that their destiny is at stake. And I think that it's time now to to show a sort of love of Europe, to 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 insist and to stress upon our cultural uh, our cultural ground, the fact that we have many things in common, that that the, the, the things uh, cultural things, cultural background that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And for example, I think that there there will be a battle of powers um, uh, at the Commission, uh, for the President of, of the European Commission, for the Parliament, for the Central uh, European Bank, bank etc. But uh, there are other positions of power, which is the, the positions for commissioners. And traditionally, um, the, the most uh, requested position is the, the, the commissioner for, for uh, competitiveness and um, and for finance and I think that the, the more and the more neglected is the commissioner for culture and it should be the country I think great states like France should ask for having a commissioner for culture and really change the background and the, the general feeling towards Europe maybe it should be Alex Taylor Alex your next question um, I'm not sure I totally agree with what everybody's saying about the fact that Europe is very complicated I don't think it's really that complicated at all it's a huge parliament people vote for it there's a commission which is more or less the equivalent of a government I think it's actually actually quite remarkable that uh, 27 or 28 countries come Everyone together talks and work. About faceless bureaucrats. That's what they say in the well, UK. Well, yes, but there's faceless bureaucrats. I don't know if you've been to the Assemblée Nationale. I don't know if you've been to the House of Commons. There's faceless bureaucrats everywhere. I mean, mm. Europe has much less <laughs> faceless bureaucrats than many of our own individual countries. Where I do agree with you um, is that I think there's um, a general lack of emotional input into Europe. Of, for example, I was, uh, two months ago, I was covering it for French television. I was in London for the uh, march against Brexit. I have traveled through European cities for 30 years doing reports. I have never, ever seen so many people so passionately, not even just young people, people of all ages, waving the European flag. I'd never seen it before, saying, not in my name. I'm very proud to be a European. During the whole of that march, there was, I say so in my book, there was, um, I just couldn't get a, a song out of my head. It was um, Janis Joplin, Yellow Taxi, I don't know if you know it. It's, and there's a line in it which just kept going through my head all the time was, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Yeah. Um, and that was exactly what it was. All of a sudden, because of Brexit, because um, all these people were having their European rights taken away from them and being plunged into something they didn't want to do. Um, meant that they felt very passionately pro-European. So maybe you have to go through that. Maybe uh, you have to see what's happening in, in, in Britain. I mean, look today what's happening. Trump is arriving. Um, they're keeping him away from the public because they're so afraid that, that everybody's going to uh, demonstrate against the, him. The and Trump Britain blimp is, will be flying over London. The blimp will be flying over. Will he see it? But the thing is that Britain is kind of suddenly realising that if you're not part of Europe you're suddenly going to be swallowed up by Trump. Oh, why is Trump want, well, so favourable for a no deal uh, for the U UK? It's because he wants to get hold of Europe, the European, uh, the, the, the British agriculture uh, market, and also and the, 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 the chlorinated, chlorinated chickens. chickens. But yeah, also, so looking forward more, to those. Than, more than anything else, he wants to get, get hold of the British health system, which he can make a packet out of. That's why he wants a no deal with the, the European Union. So I think you have to suddenly have it taken away from you to realise that um, what Europe means. And I think Europe will never be successful unless we have some emotional uh, engagement to it. And that emotional engagement I saw more than ever in London Alex two Taylor, ago. thank you very much indeed. Thanks to all our guests. Uh, more in a moment. Media Watch coming up right now. With the man himself, James Creedon. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? I'm great. And you? Very well. So just look at uh, how uh, the, in the French media the 
changing political landscape uh, in the aftermath of uh, the European elections is being uh, covered. Uh, the word explosion is coming back quite a lot, uh, in particular for the Conservative Party, Les Républicains. Uh, the chronicles of a, a, a right-wing basically uh, in, in the process of exploding, that word coming back again in Le Monde, and how they can perhaps try to prevent that. We saw that Laurent Vauquier has now uh, stood down. And so uh, basically you've got uh, the vultures from all the other parties coming in and trying to pick apart uh, the pieces of Les Républicains. The front page of Le Journal du Dimanche, um, Macron's plan to knock out the right or the it's Conservatives. It's nice that he's rubbing his hands in all yes. three there. Yes, well, well-chosen photo. Mm. Uh, and indeed, you can see that coming through uh, in lots of other examples as well. Various uh, uh, MPs uh, in La République en Marche, Thierry Solaire and others, uh, uh, calling on members of Les Républicains to just jump ship, basically, and come join La Republi République en Marche. Uh, this is another uh, uh, member of La République en Marche, uh, minister, in fact, Sébastien Lecorn Lecornu, um, basically calling on mayors from Les Républicains as well to, to, make that, uh, to make that jump, I suppose, and to switch over. Uh, and of course, then, on the other side, uh, because of course we're dealing now with kind of what, what La République en Marche would like to be a new sort of uh, binary situation between the centre and the far right, if you like, uh, Marine Le Pen making that same appeal uh, for members of, Les Rép uh, of uh, the Conservative uh, Party to, to come over and join them. And we're seeing her, her niece, uh, Marion Maréchal Le Pen, also uh, talking about a grand coalition uh, between Les Républicains and, uh, and uh, the former National Front. Uh, this is a quote, uh, kind of a, um, a quote from somebody at the Elysee Palace this morning that uh, uh, the Journal du Dimanche Sunday paper uh, heard. The two twin towers of French politics, uh, the right and the left, have been knocked. And uh, basically there's a few stages or a few levels left on, on one of the towers on, on the right and uh, before it before that completely collapses as well. It sounds, In other grim. Words, it sounds grim, yeah. Indeed. And so, of course, his strategy, uh, Emmanuel Macron, since the beginning was uh, uh, to sort of try to appeal to both sides, the, f the famous en même temps. Uh, his, a lot of his political uh, discourse was sort of uh, talking about how he was neither left nor right, uh, a little bit of both. And of course, that probably has uh, limits because what we're seeing as well is uh, uh, in, in particular, the, 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 the fact that uh, La République en Marche is also trying to appeal to uh, the green movement. So uh, it, it's quite uh, difficult, I think, to do that balancing act they across be, the board. It can't be everything to everybody, well, can they? They're the sort of trying. Uh, Pascal Confin, who is a, a, an LREM uh, MEP now, is also talking about uh, you know, these grand coalitions with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, the, um, uh, with the, the, the left wing. Uh, so in, this is one reaction from uh, a green um, a green politician, Esther Benbassa. So LREM is now making sort of soft eyes at us and trying to kind of invite us to sit around the table together. Um, I'm not going to eat this soup. Uh, even with a very long spoon, there's probably glyphosate inside in it. So I think uh, the, the notion of a poisoned chalice or some sort of an invitation to, uh, which is probably uh, quite, uh, uh, and how would you say, um, it, it's, been, it's been viewed as somewhat opportunistic and not quite sincere uh, by some. Indeed, uh, Nicolas Hulot, who is uh, the ecologist, uh, most famous, I suppose, um, ec ecological figure in France, he was the, brought in as the environment minister, jumped ship uh, very early on. He didn't give any um, particular uh, advice as to how to vote in the European elections, but he kind of did, uh, if you read between the lines. He basically said free market economics as it is currently structured, this capitalism, uh, sort of uh, unbridled capitalism is incompatible with ecology. So it's kind of a, a way of saying, I think, that Mac Emmanuel Macron's economics and ecology don't really mix. Nice to see that so. nobody can agree to disagree, but they just disagree on everything, it seems. James, thank you very much <laughs> thanks, indeed. Man. Thanks to our guests for being fantastic, all of you. And uh, thanks to you for watching. Stay with us. More to come here live from Paris.